us anxious folk. My name is Lauren. I am your host. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about leaning into that feeling of going crazy. So I guess kind of understanding how to sort of allow that sensation instead of trying to run away from it. Um, Now, I just want to let it be known that when I use the word crazy, I'm not trying to be insensitive or um, disrespectful. I'm talking about that very distinct feeling that you get when you are in the thick of high anxiety moment um, and you start to feel like you are losing it. For me, it's often uh, like a feeling of static within my body. Um, Everything feels tinged with an edge of not quite being real. Uh, And there's like this sense that there's the potential for something awful to happen. Um, And it's it's very kind of distinct as opposed to um, it's very distinct from sorry, I should say the feeling of just having a panic attack. I say just like having a panic attack is an insignificant, insignificant thing, but um yeah, it's distinct from that because it's that that kind of feeling of um, I'm not in control of my own body right now, and I I'm I also feel like I'm not quite here. So, like, how can I kind of stop myself from doing something crazy if I feel like I'm not even really um, you know, present in my own body. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about when I use the word crazy, but I apologize if that, uh, word is in any way disrespectful or, um, upsetting. It's not intended to be. Um, but yeah, so I've spoken about this in an earlier episode, but um, I will link that in the show notes as well. But I feel like it's important to talk about the reason why we experience that whole um, disassociated sort of feeling that comes on when we feel like we're going to go crazy. Uh, and when we experience that disassociation, it's the result of the chemicals that are charging around our body when we are in that Um, survival zone so there's an increase in cortisol which is the stress hormone an increase in noradrenaline uh, and these chemicals create physiological changes which feel alarming and that's by design Uh, we're supposed to pay close attention to those sensations so whenever there's a possibility of a threat or even when we're focusing on something Uh, like going into like an exam or like a test type scenario or something that we're nervous about. Uh, It's no good, for example, if we're sitting the bar exam while we're daydreaming. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like we need to be able to be focused, uh, you know, zeroed in on the immediate threat or important event or whatever it is, not distracted by anything else that's going on. Uh, But for those of us who have dealt with panic disorder or OCD or PTSD or, um, you know, anyone who has that background where we're perhaps a little bit scared of, um, you know, constantly living in survival mode and we feel those changes taking place in the body, things like blood pressure increase, muscle tension, saliva production ceasing, so that you know, brings on that sort of dry mouth sensation and dry eyes and you kind of feel like a bit scratchy and strange, Um, can't swallow very well, your pupils dilate so everything's really bright, Um, changes in blood flow direction. So that's when you get those like tingly hands and forearms and feet. Uh, For me, it's always the tingly forearms (laughs) that comes on. Um, All those kind of changes trigger something within us where we go, what the fuck? Um, so our attention is not so much on what's going on in the external environment, so on the threat, but our internal environment, which we perceive to be the threat. So what's happening in my body right now? Why does everything feel so strange? Am I going to lose it? Um, and so on and so forth. I think that in a lot of cases, that extreme disassociation is a safety mechanism. It's like, there's too much happening right now and so we mentally move just beyond it 
kind of like we're keeping like a safe distance um, but physically we're right in the thick of it so there's kind of this disconnect between body and brain and when we notice that gap it feels like all hell is breaking loose um, it feels like we're going to fall right down into it and then that increases the panic more because it's like I don't feel like I'm real I don't know if I'm actually here right now is this happening it's almost this surreal dreamlike state and it feels really hard to claw your way back into yourself, into inhabiting your own body again, um, especially because what is happening within your body feels so fucked, to put it bluntly. <laughs> um, and of course, the cruel sort of irony in all of this is that we panic about that feeling, that like surreal dreamlike feeling and what we're doing then is perpetuating the release of those stress hormones uh, so we're ultimately making our bodies feel more uninhabitable and then freaking out about that so it's like standing outside of your lounge room window uh, while your lounge room's on fire and squirting gasoline into the window and just making this fire bigger and bigger and bigger and getting more worked up that your house is on fire so obviously the antidote to that, the way we douse the fire rather than, you know, keeping on igniting it even more is by leaning in. I think some people would say, but surely we should be soothing ourselves in that moment. Um, you know, surely we should be focusing on calming down. But in my experience, leaning in is a necessary part of that. Because to use that fire analogy again, it's no good going and pouring water on the house next door when it's your house that's on fire. You can't do anything to something that you won't acknowledge or won't go near. You can't soothe something that you're also trying to run away from. So leaning in and then soothing, then easing, then calming down. That's how we find our way back to not being so alarmed by the presence of that am I going to go crazy kind of feeling. That's how we work to bridge that gap between body and brain. Now, it's kind of easier to talk about when we're just talking about anxiety or panic in general. Uh, the idea of like leaning in doesn't feel as dangerous, I guess, when you're talking about, um, you know, anxiety in general. Because I guess we know that anxiety can't kill you. Panic won't hurt you. Um, whereas leaning into that crazy feeling seems really touchy in a way. Because it's like, but what if I actually do lose it? You know, what if I need to go to hospital um, what if I actually lose touch with reality? Like, how can I lean into the possibility of that happening? Um, because I might not be safe. I had an opportunity to play with this just the other morning, actually, because I have been sick for the past week. Um, my whole family has been sick, actually. Like, the just the household just hasn't gotten better. Um, but I... Yeah, I personally was really sick, um, like stuck in bed for days, vomiting, couldn't keep down food kind of sick. And I always find that after I've had a period of being quite unwell, my anxiety tends to skyrocket for um, the days after that. So when I kind of start to like resume normal life again, my anxiety just kicks off. Um, and so... I was getting ready for work yesterday morning and I can feel it like rising up in my chest that that like feeling of I feel like I'm gonna go crazy um, you know I can feel my forearms tingling I feel like I can't quite um, breathe properly I feel the back of my neck tingling that's always one for me um, and as soon as I start to feel that dreamy sort of sensation coming on I'm like, okay, here is your chance to practice this. This is your chance to practice this leaning in. 
Um, and so I was putting my youngest down for a nap. Uh, so I'm sitting in the like recliner chair, feeding her a bottle um, in a dark room with like the white noise. And I just like all of that together kind of made me feel like I wasn't really there. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like the sound of the white noise and the darkness and just like I'm just sitting there in this rocking chair and I just feel I feel like I'm not there. Um, and then immediately my chest is getting tighter and my brain's already jumping like 20 steps ahead. Like, you know, what if what if I lose it at work or actually, to be honest, like I don't even think specific things in that moment. Like there's not like a specific thought of like, what if I get to work and then this this happens? It's just more sort of like this feeling of dread, knowing that I am going to work and the uncertainty of what might happen when I'm there. So yeah, not really a specific thought. It's just like this, this all over kind of like, Um, and then couple that with the feeling of not really feeling like I'm there, that disassociated kind of feeling. It was a lot. So I noticed that my chest is going tight and I focused on creating as much space as I possibly could within that tightness. Um, so I'm imagining like a, an oval or like a field you know like creating this huge grassy expanse of just space within my chest Um, and it it helped me to to picture a field it helped me to kind of have that um, that idea to focus on in terms of creating space it gave me like a way to kind of think about distance in a way that my my mind's eye could picture I guess because I'm not particularly good personally at like visualizing things unless I unless it's somewhere I've been or it's something that's like specifically spelled out to me spelled out to me I should say um so yeah thinking about a field or an oval or just a really big grassy area helped me a lot to to think about space and then I also started to bring in the concept of like a breeze and like lots of air and just like bird noises and lots of things happening in this big wide open space and then I found that I had the space available to start leaning in to that sort of surreal like um I just thought of a show that it reminds me of this is such a random tangent but um Oh, it's going to drive me nuts now. If anyone can think of it, let me know. But there's a show, Twin Peaks, just came to me. (laughs) Yeah, Twin Peaks, where everything was like a bit eerie and a bit weird. Um, That's what it feels like for me. (laughs) That feeling of like, what if I go crazy? My my whole world feels like it's tinged with this whole like Twin Peaks vibe. Anyway, that wasn't important. Sorry for going off on that tangent. (laughs) But, But yeah, so I have that space opened up kind of inside my chest and I lean back in the chair and I kind of like let my head just fall back while I'm still feeding my daughter the bottle and I explore those sensations of not feeling real so like I said I can feel my arms tingling I explore that feeling like I really kind of like turn the volume up on it um and you know, letting, letting myself feel faint, like that feeling, that staticky feeling where it's like, I'm not really in the world right now. I approach that feeling kind of like how, if you were falling asleep, um, you know, that period between like wake and sleep where you're sort of like just drifting off. I kind of let it feel like that. Um, and thought about it feeling like that and then I was able to kind of like you know just sort of drift off into it Uh, I kind of also told myself that I was exhausted you know making space for it to be like another another possibility of maybe I'm just tired you know maybe it's been a big week which it had 
uh, and maybe I can lean into this sensation as just my body being exhausted rather than my body freaking out right now. And then the next thing I did was the physiological sigh. This is from um, the Huberman lab. Andrew Huberman is a neuroscientist at Stanford <laughs> University. Uh, and he has a great podcast, which I think I've referenced a few times. Uh, but the physiological sigh is something that they came up with uh, at Stanford because it's one of the most accessible ways to, uh, I guess, to calm yourself down, to kind of access that parasympath parasympathetic branch of the nervous system, which is the, the calm down response. Um, and so basically what you do is you take two short breaths in, in quick succession through your nose, and then a long breath out through your mouth. Uh, and anytime you lengthen the out breath more than the in breath, you are going to be activating the calm down response. And if you do the opposite, if you lengthen your in breath and shorten your out breath, you are going to be activating the like alert sort of like focus kind of response, the stress response. But sometimes that's needed. Sometimes you need to be alert and focused as we spoke about before. So that's just a little... FYI, that's very handy to know. Um, but I like the physiological side because it's easy to remember and it kind of, it gives you something to focus on like mentally as well. Uh, we spoke about this in the last episode with um, the lovely Elia Pritchard from the Kaleidoscope channel. She was talking all about, um, you know, how breath work kind of gives you something to do physically, but something to do mentally as well, which is really helpful. So um, the physiological sigh in particular enables us to reset in the sense that it increases the oxygen levels in our body and decreases the carbon dioxide levels. Um, and yeah, it's just really calming and lovely and easy to do. So after I do this, I'm feeling a lot more calm uh, and more like I'm inside the possibility of maybe going crazy, but like welcoming towards it and more curious about it as opposed to stressing out about it and panicking about it. Um, so I want to be very clear that it's not that these practices took away that fear of like, what if I go crazy? Um, but they allow me to approach that feeling from a more uh, calm and a more nurturing standpoint. And I always think of it as being just like how I'd approach my kids if they were scared or if they'd had a nightmare or if, um, you know, if something really frightening had happened to them, I wouldn't ignore it. I wouldn't expect them to ignore it or expect them to not be scared. I would just love them. Like I would hold them and I would kiss them and I would be there with them. And that's really what I'm trying to get at in this episode that we need to love ourselves through this stuff more than we need to run away from it or try and suppress it or try and stop it from happening. Um, because I think the more I travel through life and dealing with anxiety, not just even on like a personal anxiety disorder level, but even on like a, you know, general life anxiety level, like the kind of anxiety that can come along after a worldwide pandemic for example you know what I mean like there's always going to be anxiety provoking events in everyone's lives um, I understand more that I don't want to learn how to be totally unflappable in the face of fear I don't want to learn how to be fearless I don't want to be someone who doesn't freak out ever uh, and I don't want to be so strong that emotions don't really affect me I appreciate the darker emotions just as much as I appreciate the lighter emotions. I don't always like them as much. I don't always enjoy them as much in the moment, but I don't want to not feel them. Um, I want to be able to really care for myself and to know how to always have my heart open towards every emotion. 
So that's always my goal with panic and anxiety and the like, what if I shit my pants or what if I go crazy or what if I lose control? Like all of those kind of fears. I always want to know that I have my heart and my mind wide open to whatever may occur within me and through me because it's all my experience. It all belongs to me. Um, and I, I want to be present and accountable, not accountable. I want to be present and I want to feel all of it as much as I can. Uh, which brings me to the next point, which is, uh, I won't lie to you, very much inspired by a movie I recently saw. Uh, if you follow me on Instagram, you will have seen me post on my stories about this. Um, it's a movie called Words on Bathroom Walls such a beautiful movie I didn't expect to like it I just put it on because you know I was sick and I was like I'll just watch some kind of trash this looks okay uh I always do that with movies I'm always like meh and then I watch it and I love it I gotta stop being so stubborn when it comes to like actually trying things (laughs) that's a note to self anyway uh I watched it I loved it I cried. I actually watched it again less than 24 hours later because I loved it so much. Uh, There was so much about it that was really cleverly done. And honestly, it's just a beautiful movie about mental illness. I'm not going to give anything about it away here if you haven't seen it. But there is a theme that runs through the movie about being open hearted. And this is something that I've spoken about before as well, Uh, especially in a video I did called you when you can't trust your gut Uh, I spoke about not knowing how to move forward some days because the messages that we uh, get from our body when we have anxiety are confusing and we kind of forget how to um, you know trust trust your gut we forget how to kind of tune into the body and so my solution to that was to follow your heart which is something that is said so often and is like, you know, a kind of a cheesy like Disney sort of thing and probably makes some people cringe. But I think that when it comes to anxiety, <clears throat> especially, we really do close off our hearts to ourselves and to everyone around us as well. Um, we don't want to be seen. We don't want people to know that we're panicking. We don't want people to see us humiliate ourselves that's at the core of a lot of toilet anxiety issues um it's like i'm terrified that i'm not going to be loved that i'm not going to be enough that i'm going to be rejected or laughed at or in some way separated from everyone else and so i separate myself before that can happen i shut myself off from fear i shut myself off from you know from the potential of something awful happening to me that makes me feel unlovable basically and when we do this we forget so many basic principles like we are loved we belong we are inherently worthy uh we will be okay and with the whole like what if i go crazy thing we forget that if that happens we will still be loved we will still be us um we will still be just as deserving and just as important and just as beautiful and just as wonderful as we always were. Um, I think the most necessary part of leaning in is to really open your heart to yourself. So know that you are loved, know that you will be okay. If you have to verbally remind yourself, then do that. Um, I just sat there when I was feeding my daughter, sat there in the chair, silently telling myself, you are loved, you are loved, you love people, you love your friends and family, they love you, Um, your friends and family will still love you if you go crazy. And that alone brings in such a warmth that it's almost like that gap that I spoke about between, um, you know, mind and body that gap becomes just like this space of light for lack of a better word it's not scary if i fall down that gap anymore um like it still might be intense it still might be like a little bit scary but i know that at the end of it i'm going to be held i know that i'm safe even if i feel 
momentarily um, unsafe. So to recap, um, <clears throat> when it comes to leaning in to that fear of what if I go crazy and leaning into that kind of that f- that fear and that feeling that comes up when you are kind of disassociating and panicking about the fact that you're disassociating. What I find really helps is to create as much space as you can inside yourself in whatever way works best for you. For me, it was, you know, picturing a field, a big grassy open space. And then once I'd created that space, it was going in and kind of leaning in further to those physical sensations. So the sensations of like my arms tingling, the sensations of, um, you know, like just feeling a bit weak or a bit faint, uh, feeling kind of like I can't catch my breath, just really exploring those sensations and, um, turning the volume up on them and then after that doing the physiological sigh which is two breaths in in quick succession through the nose and then one long breath out through the mouth and then also really opening your heart to not only yourself but to everyone else as well and so reminding yourself that you are loved that um, you know even if you went crazy you would still love you your friends and family would still love you like you are still inherently worthy of love even if all of that happens and reminding yourself verbally of that if you have to uh, or in any way that that works best for you even sometimes I find like giving little pig a cuddle or Charlie a cuddle who are my dogs by the way if you don't know uh, giving them a cuddle um, kind of helps to remind me that I am loved. Uh, I don't know why that does that. I guess because they, you know, pets love you so unconditionally that I think it's, um, it's kind of the quickest way to remind ourselves that like, oh my God, you know, even if I am like, even if I feel like I'm at my worst, my dogs still love me. (laughs) Um, and it kind of, yeah, gives us maybe the ability to open a bit more to the possibility that we might actually be lovable even when we feel like we're not. Um, so yeah, I hope that episode has helped. Um, I I just want you to know that I I get how scary that feeling is because I still get scared when I feel it every time, but I am learning how to open more to it and. I really hope that um, that if it's available to you, that you can start to try and lean into it as well. Because I think it's really important, like I said, to really start acknowledging that we need the bad emotions just as much as the good ones. And I think we need to um, really work on nurturing ourselves rather than trying to make ourselves fit some kind of mold or, um, you know, kind of beat ourselves into submission or into being stronger or better or, you know, more managed or whatever. Like I just, I'm really passionate about opening to those emotions that don't always feel good uh, because they're a part of our human experience. Anyway, I could ramble on about that for a long time and I won't. So (laughs) yeah, I hope you're all doing really, really well and I will see you in the next episode. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Us Anxious Folk podcast, the podcast for the chronically overwhelmed, perpetually panicked, anxious folk in all of us. If you would like to find more about me, you can find me on YouTube at Lauren Rose or on Instagram at Lauren R underscore Rose.